A couple of weeks ago, I was traveling back to Stoke by train, having attended an event in London. It was early evening and the train was really busy and in fact, rather chaotic. Seat reservations were really random with two other people allocated to the same seat as me, which would have been a bit cozy. <laughs> and the computerized reservation system was advertising every seat as available. Thankfully, our carriage was filled with affable travelers, so we all agreed to sit wherever there was a space and hope for the best. I ended up around a table with three Mancunian men who were chatty and friendly from the get go. It quickly emerged that two were dedicated Manchester United football supporters and one was a Man City fan. Each of them could easily have one mastermind with the specialist subject of football. They knew so much about players and pay deals, moves on the pitch and moves between clubs. Their memories of specific matches and seasons were extraordinary. Not being a football fan myself and all this feeling like gobbledygook really, um, I eventually retreated to working on my laptop until a conversation about tribalism between clubs, between football clubs, offered an unexpected opportunity to talk about religion and to reveal my role as a priest. I have to say that moment was a bit like, whoa, <laughs> from them. <laughs> One of the men then proceeded to give an account of a recent meeting between he and his wife and their local vicar. The couple told the priest they wanted to participate in church, but they struggled to attend services on a Sunday morning due to weekend family commitments. They asked the vicar if he would consider starting a weekday gathering after school hours, which might appeal to some other families. But their request fell on stony ground, with the priest unwilling to offer anything other than Sunday morning attendance. Here we have a scenario of a family keen to explore the seeds of Christian discipleship, yet finding no depth of spiritual soil within which to root themselves. No loving church community to support them if the scorching circumstances of life threaten to wither away their faith. The sower in today's gospel scatters seed all over the Palestinian landscape. It falls on paths, rocky ground, amongst thorns, and in good soil. The sower does not discriminate and choose where the seed lands, but offers it up to the diverse terrain and unpredictable climate and environment. The parable is focused on how the seed is received, welcomed, and nurtured. Have any of you actually visited Israel-Palestine? Yeah, Mo, is it not? Yes, yes. Excellent. So some of you will be familiar with the landscape there. And compared to our, sorry, you're going to say something then? No? Oh, I thought, I love a bit of participation. <laughs> it was very barren. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, compared to our lush green pastures, my experience also of, of the Palestinian landscape is of exactly what's described in the gospel, dry ground, rocks, bushes, and terraces, amazing terraces where they grow crops, um, just as we've heard described. And the original hearers of this parable at the time of Jesus would have been very familiar with the challenges of sowing seed and growing crops in Galilee and Judea. In the gospel, Jesus goes on to explain the parable of the sower to his disciples, not leaving them in any doubt of his comparison between this agricultural narrative and openness to revelation of the kingdom of God. Chapter 13, if you read on, is actually dedicated to a range of parables expressing aspects of the kingdom. Jesus doesn't use logic or argument to reveal the kingdom to his listeners but story. The stories we tell reflect our culture, parables being a much loved feature of Judaism. In ancient Israel, the parables of Hebrew scripture 
what we obviously call the Old Testament, would have been told at home in the evening, after dinner, and also in workshops, in fields, in, in synagogues. The stories Jesus tells connect with the everyday circumstances of farmers, shepherds, fishermen, and other aspects of life in Palestine. Parables were actually meant to shock their audiences out of their comfortable assumptions about God, about society, about life. They challenged prejudice and injustice. They invited hearers to reflect on and change their attitudes and behaviours. I was recommended a book about the parables by someone called Amy Jill Levine. The author is Jewish, a professor of New Testament and Jewish studies in the United States. And as a Jew, Levine offers important insight into the original context of Jesus' parables. She relates them to the specific Jewish culture and the practices of the day. Parables are not meant to be easily understood, but they're meant to cause discomfort to listeners. They're meant to hold paradoxes and ambiguity that we have to work through and, and struggle with. Levine says, what makes the parables mysterious or difficult is that they challenge us to look into the hidden aspects of our own values, our own lives. They bring to the surface unasked questions and they reveal the answers we have always known but refuse to acknowledge. Our reaction to them should be one of resistance rather than acceptance. She goes on to say, religion has been defined as designed to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. Religion has been defined as designed to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. And the parables of Jesus do the afflicting. If we hear a parable and think, oh, I really like that, or fail to take any challenge, then we are not listening well enough. I think what surprised me most was Levine's understanding that the original gospel writers were also sometimes attempting to control the meaning of Jesus's parables in some of their interpretations, maybe diluting the directness of his challenges. We, we weren't there, we don't know. We have to rely on what we read. But she suggests, for example, that in the Gospel of Luke, when he interprets the parable of the unjust judge and the demanding widow, and says it's about never giving up on prayer, he possibly minimizes the unfairness and lack of compassion that Jesus wanted to evidence in the story. Jesus intended his parables to be challenging and to raise more questions than answers. And not only the gospel writers, but the modern church tends to all too easily to domesticate them and often to turn them into children's stories. In our society today, it's harder to relate to the original parables of Jesus because most of us are not farmers, fishermen or shepherds. However, we and the communities around us are crying out for stories. They are crying out for stories that reveal the kingdom in our everyday lives. They're crying out for signs of justice, of hope, of healing and of peace. God the sower is always sowing the seed. Anywhere and everywhere people will receive his love. Growing the kingdom in the most fertile and in the most barren areas of our world today. The question is, are we all open to seeing and receiving God in every aspect of our lives? And in the lives of our communities. In the lives of football fans traveling on an evening train. What are the parables of today that challenge us to address the injustices of our world? The stories, the personal stories of those affected by war, by poverty, by climate change, that will often leave us with more questions than answers. And are we willing to let those stories change and transform us 
and enable us to grow in our Christian faith. Faith can thrive within a loving church community like St. Paul's. But familiarity can sometimes also lead us into comfort and into complacency, which does hamper our change and our growth. That's at individual, at personal and at collective community levels. The fourth century theologian Gregory of Nyssae actually defined sin as the failure to grow. Sin as the failure to grow. I believe those outside our churches can challenge us to change and grow if we relate to them with open minds and hearts and don't assume that we as church have all the theological answers. As our Stoke communities reveal aspects of the kingdom through their everyday stories, we can help them see how these experiences connect with the golden thread of God's love that is weaving through their lives. We will learn from each other, changing and growing together. So let's not be like the vicar in Manchester who was unwilling to contemplate a change to his church that could have nurtured the seeds of faith in not just one family's life, but several families in that community. Let's be the good soil, willing to be tilled and cultivated so that we can bear the beautiful, life-giving fruit of transformation. Amen. <laughs>